What do you do, when there is nothing else left? I was a college graduate who, two years after collecting my certificate, was still unemployed. There was a gaping blank on my resume. Add to that the fact that my debts were out of control, and it's fair to say I was a mess, and growing ever more desperate. So what was I doing about this? How was I digging myself out of a hole? I was staying up all night trolling through the internet. Is there a point at which the internet does end and sanity begins? I neither knew nor cared. I watched thousands of clips, read conspiracy theories and news reports until they blurred into one stream of hyperbole. I slept fitfully during the day, and went back online the minute I woke up. I would surf, even though I needed to go to the bathroom, until it hurt. I forgot to eat or drink, and soon I had a permanent background headache. Like a lot of addicts it was not long before I moved on to the harder stuff. The deep web. I was sickened by a lot of what I saw, but still immersed myself more and more. When I stumbled across the site that changed my life, it looked fairly innocuous at first. There was a simple hero image of the outline of a human body, and a drop-down menu in the top right-hand side access via three short lines. For other people it's one more bet, one more drink. I clicked on one more link. I was surprised to see only two options, buyer and seller. I wasn't going to be buying anything real soon, so I followed the Warren Marks seller. This sub-menu left me open-mouthed. It listed items that could be sold and gave the price the seller would receive. All I needed to do, was add details for my preferred way to receive payment then tick the box next to the item. The first item on the list was likeness. For the price shown, I could pay the two months I was overdue on my rent, and buy wine and pizza every night for a week with what was left over. Now I was not sure, what was meant by likeness. Other items that I could sell via the website were more straightforward. Things like my social security number, my date of birth, even my name. A lot of these seemed like a way, to commit fraud for the buyers. All very dubious, but at least, I thought, they were paying to use these details, rather than simply stealing them as so often happened. Likeness seemed more ethereal though. I decided it meant the right to use my image. A photograph of my face. I also decided I really wanted a beer and pizza, and to be able to tell my landlord, to get off my back, because I have paid your damn rent. I added my details for the money transfer and ticked the box next to likeness. Press submit. A transaction processing symbol turned into transaction complete. A new box appeared giving me the option to comment. I typed. Do you need me to send you my photograph? Thinking this would answer my question about what exactly I had just sold. A moment later the reply came. We already have it. I flashed back to some of the things I had done in front of the computer screen, then decided I would rather not think about it. Feeling nervous sure I was being scammed, about to kick myself for being so naive I checked my balance. What do you know? The money was in there. I went back to the good old innocent web and ordered the largest most overloaded pizza I could think of, then began to add sides. It took two weeks for me to blow the money from selling my likeness. I had had a great time, without leaving my apartment, and I had paid no rent. Not to worry, I told myself and returned to the deep web and my new favorite website. This time, I hovered over fingerprints. 30 seconds considering, flagged a dozen dodgy things this could lead to, but it was the money I would make, that made me think, whatever. I ticked and submitted. This time 10 small boxes appeared on screen with an instruction for me to place the ends of my fingers in them. Which I did and within seconds the transaction was complete, and within minutes I could see that I was once again flush. Problems over. I could pay my rent and enough off a credit card to make that bank back off. In the comment box I typed. Thank you. The reply was almost immediate, you are welcome. Now, I don't know, if anyone reading this is a gambler. But I guess if they are, they would not by now have put money on me spending the money wisely. And they would be right. This time, I told myself another couple of weeks later, I would get my act in gear. I spent significant time going through the items I could sell and created a spreadsheet with how much I owed, so I knew the amount I needed to earn with this one final sale a part of me. I had decided, you see, that this had to be the last time. There was a relatively small number of things left I could sell, that I was prepared to sell. My name, date of birth, and social security number were still no-goes. I did not want to risk losing the ability, to have a bank account and find employment. 
A history of being a disaster did not mean, in my mind, that I always would be. So, one final sale it was, then clear my debts and find a job. I ticked the box next to sell body part. From the next list, tick kidney. I was close to hyperventilating when I pressed submit. Close to tears not long afterwards, when I checked my balance. I felt a huge pressure being lifted. With this money I could finally get my life back on track. The comment box already had text in it. I had been too worked up to read it, so I took a deep breath and did. It was an 8 digit reference number, an address and a time later that day. An appointment for me to have my kidney removed, I figured. I considered not going. I already had the money, so why bother? Then I thought back to the message telling me they already had my photograph. Whoever ran the website probably knew where I lived as well, or could easily find out. It was not rocket science to work out that they were probably bad people, criminals, some kind of gang. Not people to cross or mess with. I felt sick as I left the apartment at the prospect of having an operation, but also elated at the amazing things lying ahead for me. I just needed to get this over with. The address turned out to be nondescript building on the outskirts of town. The windows were all shuttered and there was no signage, just the human outline I recognized from the website. The keypad was fixed into the wall next to a sturdy looking door. Not sure what else to do, I entered my reference number. The door slid open with a sigh. My stomach doing backflips, I stepped inside. I could hear the drone of an air conditioner, but still suddenly felt very hot. Nerves, I told myself. Totally natural. I seemed to be in some kind of reception area, but it was deserted scratch that. A man appeared. He was wearing a white overall and mask and safety glasses. He may or may not have been smiling when he said, Welcome, let's get you prepped. I followed him along the long corridor. The walls were blank, whitewashed, and the smell of antiseptic was growing stronger. Eventually, he turned off into a small windowless room. I hesitated on the threshold. There was a raised table, fluorescent strips overhead. A stack of equipment next to the bed. Medical, I guess, though I had no idea. Please, the man said and gestured that I should come in. I smiled weakly and did. He gave me a robe to put on and turned to do something to the equipment while I got changed. I assumed I needed to lie on the table, and when he looked round from whatever it was he had been doing and saw me he said, good. Made me feel like a dog rolling over and playing dead, but I kept this to myself. I did though have some questions. Is this safe? I asked. Perfectly, he replied without missing a beat. I wasn't sure. I felt hot to the point where I thought I was going to faint. And the lighting overhead was flickering, making pain start to flower above my eyes. I'm not sure I want to go ahead with this, I said. There is nothing to be concerned about, he replied, and, before I realized what was happening, had nicked the skin of my neck with a needle. I immediately felt an unpleasant tingling sensation, and a numbness began to spread up into my face. He picked up a tablet computer that was resting among the equipment, and studied it for a moment before turning back to look at me and asking, Now, which eye would you like to keep? What? I exclaimed or tried to, because my lips were numb and the word came out slurred. What are you talking about? I managed. I sold one of my kidneys, not my eyes. I did not wait for an answer. I was horrified and decided I wanted out of there. I tried to sit up, but the numbness had spread to my spine, and then my arms. I was helpless to do anything but lie there, and watch as he once more studied the tablet. No, no, he said in a quiet, relaxed voice. The records show that you agreed to sell a body part, but did not specify which one. I tick kidney, I tried to say, but by now my mouth would not move, and I could not feel my tongue. I could feel my heart beating faster and faster, felt like I could not breathe. Cold sweat trickled down into my eyes, blurring my vision. I could see this. I could not feel it. I wanted to scream. Wanted to cry out in terror. But my jaws were locked, my limbs useless. All I could do was watch as the scalpel came into view, and as he lowered it slowly towards my left eye. It will all be over soon, he said, and then the blade became a shadow over my eye, a darkness that was soon all I could see. That was then. This is now. I am writing this in an internet cafe, after trashing my laptop's hard drive and ditching it. There's just me in here and the owner. I think he would like me to leave from the dirty looks he is giving me. But before I head off, I have one more thing to do. 
I have enough money to buy a coach ticket and go a long way from here, away from everything and everyone I have ever known. I have just logged onto the site and found what I am looking for in the seller menu. Name, date of birth, social security number. I tick sell on all three, enter the details in the boxes that pop up, press submit, and moments later the money is in my account. I have been withdrawing as much cash as I can daily, and after I go across the road to the ATM and withdraw the latest amount, I will snap my card in half and throw it away. Only, the screen has changed, the comment box has opened up, and a new message has appeared. We like and follow you. I feel tears begin to flow from the eye they did not take. I used to be a normal person. I just want to get that out clear first of all yeah, I had a few strange hobbies, but when this all started out I was just like your average Cho. One of my strange hobbies was browsing the deep web it was mostly out of curiosity, let me assure you. I wasn't involved in anything shady and also made sure to take adequate precautions. One day I was just looking at random web pages, when I stumbled upon a curious one. Hello there. Are you perhaps interested in buying other people's souls? I've been collecting people's souls for a very long time, and I have a bit extra. It was one of the most basic web pages that you could imagine, with only an address on where to send the Bitcoin to buy one. I laughed when I saw this I had seen my share of scams on the deep web, but this one was new. I went to close the window, before something popped up on my screen. Hello there. I see you're browsing my site. My heart nearly froze as I saw it was a chat box. But I was sure the security measures I had taken were sufficient to prevent someone from tracking me or hacking into my computer. How did this pop-up appear out of nowhere then? Relax. I just noticed that you were going to leave without buying anything. It seems you haven't been convinced what I'm selling is real. Why not try a free sample? A simple yes and no dialog box appeared. Now, I should have clicked on no, but in my curiosity, I clicked on yes. A bad decision in hindsight, but I wanted to know where this was going. It's rather hard to explain what possessing a soul is like. You probably think that a soul is immutable or indestructible in other words. And you'd be right, in that moment I could tell in my head that I held a single soul. But, there was a way for me to manifest it in the real world. It appeared as a tiny ball of light no bigger than the smallest bone in your pinky. I reached out to touch it, and a flood of memories entered my head. The soul was of a woman by the name of Alexandra Cortez. She had not had a very happy childhood, and had escaped her home when she turned 16. A few bad decisions involving drugs and she had literally nothing left on her, and was slowly dying. It was here, that her memories became less clear there was a strange shadow, that I could see, but nothing clearer than that. Mind you, everything else that I could see, had been as clear as if I was the one seeing it. But this figure was covered in what I could only describe as dark smog. She had sold her soul to this thing in exchange for money. The rest of her life was rather good not fantastic by any means, but it was still decent and paradise compared to what she had suffered earlier. It all ended one day when she was walking along a dark street corner and a man ambushed her. She died that night, though not before hours of torture at his hands. There was far more of course I had her entire life in my hands, but I only put down the important bits given her whole biography could fill up several books. That wasn't all though I could hear her thoughts as I held her soul in my hand. She was pleading begging me to let her go. Now, you're probably wondering what the afterlife is like. I have to confess that I never found out just that there was something beyond where souls could go to. After listening to her pleadings I agreed to let her go. Much as I said earlier, I can't really explain how I let her go just that I did. She vanished before me, and the light also went away with her, leaving my mind completely clear. I thought what had happened was just some sort of odd hallucination, or rather, I hoped that that was what it was. I didn't want to believe there was some monster collecting souls around on the internet. That was until four days later when I got an anonymous email linking back to that site. Hello there. I hope you enjoyed your free sample. Perhaps you would like to purchase another. We're having a sale now. The mail confirmed for me that it wasn't some weird fever dream, and after a moment's hesitation, I decided to make an actual purchase. I should have realized that something was wrong the moment I saw the prices. They were dirt cheap, which made very little sense given what I learned later on. 
I got the souls of three more women and they were quite similar in many ways. Much like with Alexandra, I couldn't see the entity they sold their souls to properly. The amounts of money they got for their souls were quite staggering I had barely paid 0.0001% of that price. Again, that should have told me that something was off about this whole thing, but I was rather oblivious to the fact then. What I was more focused on was that they had all died in similar ways, by being ambushed by a man. They never saw his face though, but they had all died in agonizing ways. Letting their souls go free brought a certain peace to my mind. Kind of like animal rights activists who buy animals intended for slaughter and then release them, I guess. Except I was releasing these human souls from damnation I highly doubted that whatever entity bought them in the first place was kind to them. I bought another one a few days afterward, and it was here that things took a dark turn. It was the soul of a man named Christopher. I don't want to share his full name here, but that hadn't even been what I had been concentrating on at the time. No, when I went through the memories of his life, I was sickened by what I saw. This man was a serial killer. Those four women I told you about earlier. He was the one who had killed them. He had done it to over 17 more. The mere thought of it made me want to throw up. Again, I couldn't see the figure to whom he sold his soul to. He hadn't done it for money, no, he had been caught by the police, and had exchanged his soul for getting out of jail. Some sort of legal loophole was there because the police didn't document a piece of evidence correctly, and he was let go. And he killed again. And again. Ten more victims before being caught and given the death penalty. Much like those before him, he begged to be released. But, no sort of compassion emerged in my mind. I was sickened by what he had done and appalled that he had suffered so little compared to his victims. In my rage, I took hold of his soul and wondered what I could do with it. I could now hear him pleading again in my mind, but I ignored that and lit the stove. I then dropped the small ball of light onto the flame. Oh, he definitely felt that. He couldn't die, but he could feel the flame consume him. I could hear his screams, and though at first I was disgusted with myself, I learned to live with it. This man had no regrets or remorse for what he had done aside from the fact that he was dead. It became a daily routine for me. I would try to find new ways to torment him. I would stick him in my freezer. I would stab his soul with a knife. I even thought about buying acid from somewhere to dip him in, but that would have raised too many questions. I never really considered myself to be a vindictive person, I think it was because I had been so close to some of his victims, and had felt all they felt when they died, that I did what I did. Eventually, I got tired of this after a few weeks and let him go, but in case you're worried I assure you he suffered ten times worse than what he had dealt out. I then bought another soul a couple of weeks later. This one belonged to a woman who had killed three of her own children. My heart was hardened from before and I went about my way making sure she got what she deserved. It continued like that nearly every soul that I bought was some sort of horrible criminal. I didn't get any innocence to release like I did earlier. Soon, my apartment had over two dozen of them. I spent nearly every free waking hour tormenting them as much as I could. It was more addicting than anything I had ever tried before. Eventually, I ran into a small roadblock though the prices for the souls increased. Exponentially, I should add they were worth right about how much they should have been. I had already released a good number and was quite frustrated that I couldn't get my hands on some more. I got an email a few days after that. Hey there champ. Seems that you're a bit short on cash lately, but since you've been such a great customer, I was thinking that you could have a few of them for free. With a few strings attached, of course. I barely even read the conditions as I agreed to it that was just how much I was hooked. Now, I have over a hundred souls. I spend all of my time dealing with them it's strange, but I don't think I've eaten something in the past few months. I haven't even gone to work, and I thought they'd kick me out of my apartment for non-payment of rent one day but they haven't. I have noticed a few changes, when it comes to my body as well. There are two small bumps on the top of my head, that won't go away I've been meaning to go to a doctor but haven't found the time. My skin has turned a different color as well, and I feel something growing out of my back. But really, I can't be bothered with all of that. A new shipment of souls has come from the website, and I need to get to work on them. I wish I'd never watched that video. I thought I'd grow out of shit like that by the time I'd hit 20. Yet there I was, off my tits on some choice MDMA Jeff hooked us up with.
turning through some kind of hardcore sadomasochism site. The kind of videos you're surprised aren't on the dark web. If you ever stumbled across the Pain Olympics or 4chan you'll know what I'm talking about. When I was a teenager mates and I would gather round a PC screen. Playing chicken to see who could watch the most extreme content without leaving the room or puking. This was like that, but with a tablet, and nobody is sober. In my defense it wasn't my idea. Luke's cousin was down for the weekend. Young lad, about 16 I think. Not too bright, but kept himself to himself. Which meant he wasn't going to get us caught sneaking him into the rave underage. As usual, afterwards we found ourselves at a flat party, and then in Luke's bedroom. It wasn't until about 4am, when those who were able had sauntered off to get laid, that the usual rounds of spliff and internet began. This was when Luke's cousin started suggesting weirder and weirder shit. We all thought at first that it was just a Mandy. He was young after all, and teenage desire to be seen as edgy mixed with calm down anxiety was a plausible explanation. After a while though, one of us, I was too fucked to remember who, but I hope it wasn't me, started to entertain his suggestions. Everybody there enjoyed horror films after all. We had more than one forum saw our hostile marathon after a night out. What was the harm? Soon enough we found ourselves at the familiar group cringe and there was then, of course, the unending debate over whatever macabre footage we just put ourselves through was real. Luke's cousin was in control by that point. We hadn't noticed how quiet he'd gotten. He sat there on the floor, legs crossed. Leaning forward every so often to click the next video. Had this look on his face the whole time, like he was searching for something specific. He never skipped anything though. No matter what the video showed he just sat back, watching whatever it was making the rest of us make melodramatic crouching noises unfold. Once one video finished he scoured the algorithm suggestions for the next. He'd ignored all of ours by this point, so we'd stopped bothering. We were more than a few blunts into our session, and holding our focus on anything other than the rich conversation about which of the girls we knew would be a good smash was difficult. I remember him sighing disappointedly at every video he found, except for the last, when he found that one he licked his lips, rocking slightly. He must have known. No way the creepy little fuck found it by accident. When he clicked play we all knew this one was going to be different. I'm not sure how. Call if instinct. Something was off about it, which when you consider the kind of website we were surfing said a lot. Before the footage started the rest of us had been laughing and joking in a blunt smoked haze. The vibe of the room switched in less than a heartbeat. The moment sound started to seep from the tinny speaker, every chemically stimulated mind enraptured by the figure on the 12-inch tablet screen. It was a girl. Younger than us, but older than Luke's cousin. Pretty, but not in the conventional sense. I say pretty because she wasn't exactly hot. Not the kind of looks you try and buy a drink. She had a pleasantness to the eye that I can't really put in words. To describe her would make her sound plain, almost ugly, drooping cheeks, large eyes surrounded by makeup done a little too much, lipstick ever so just the wrong shade of red. Hair that had been brushed but was in obvious need of a wash. Not the sort of girl I'd give a second or third look under any other circumstance. In that smoky room she was all I could think about. The first two minutes of footage were her staring at the camera in front of a grey wall. The shot was well lit, and the camera was expensive, all the lines and imperfections of her face were visible. Her mick was clearly pricey, too. When she finally parted her lips the sound of them peeling apart was quite audible. The breaths between her words came through as though she were in the room with us. She talked for a whole five minutes, before anything interesting happened. 
I don't know when the lads had last focused on something for that long at that time in the morning. Maybe never. Luke, Hunt, Jack, Lyle, and I, all sat on the mattress and beanbags, hypnotized by the movement of her puffed lips, whispering semi-nonsense at us. She spoke a lot about necessity and excess, about evolution and optimization, deconstruction and renewal. Subjects that didn't really seem to be linked to me at the time. It goes without saying I understand it all now, but then it just came across as meaningless word salad. It didn't matter. I would have listened to that face read even something as dull as the Bible for 500 years if given the chance. She said her last words and held up a potato peeler. I didn't think much of it. I was too lost in those dark eyes of hers. She asked us all to remember that everything we do is to achieve perfection. Something like that, at least. The exact phrasing doesn't matter, it's the idea that counts. Perfection. The room, with the exception of Luke's cousin, jumped in unison when the footage cut to black. The switch was accompanied with a loud crash, the sound of something heavy landing on the lowest notes of a grand piano. You can try this at home. The words appeared letter by letter in a white typewriter font. Sporadic detune piano notes played over the scrolling text, along with muffled grunts and the scraping bangs of God knows what being dragged across the floor. The hair on my arms stood on end. I wasn't grinning and laughing anymore. I was still high, but barely. From the quick glances I exchanged with the rest of the lads I could tell they were in a similar state. Everybody except Luke's cousin, of course. The camera had been moved about 10 feet away from the woman. For some reason this didn't affect the definition of her face. The wrinkles of her top lip, the poorly concealed spot on her nostril, the blobs left over from over-generous application of eyeliner and mascara, all were just as clear as when she had been a few inches from the screen. She wasn't smiling anymore. Her drooping cheeks were slick with tears, and they wobbled in time with the trembling of her jaw. Her large eyes stared into the camera, into us, pleading for help both sides of the screen knew wasn't coming. She was still holding the potato peeler next to her head. Unlike her bottom lip, her grip was steady. We could see her clothes now, too. She was wearing a skirted suit. And an expensive one at that. My plan for after uni was to go into banking. I'm versed enough in tailoring to recognize quality fabric when I see it. The sobbing woman had on the uniform of the financially successful. The men stood either side of her were naked. They were each a few feet taller than her. An impressive feat, since even though she was sat down, you could tell the woman was tall. The length of her slender legs was a testament to this. How their stubby legs supported their weight was a mystery to me. The hanging belly flap almost touched the floor. Their skin shone with grease, sweat and dirt. And were it not for the fact I knew it's impossible, I would have sworn under oath that I could smell the pungent odor of curdled milk whenever I looked at either of them for too long. The one to her left was holding a transparent bucket filled with a clear liquid that I hoped was water. To her right was a silver tray. I can't comment on what the men looked like. I couldn't see their faces through the orange shopping bags over their heads. The cheap plastic was fastened in place with about a half dozen zip ties round each man's neck. The crinkled skin pulled so taut that the shapes of their faces were visible. A pair of orange-bound skulls on the peaks of twin mountains of glistening flesh. The only movement from either was the steady in out of the bag being pushed and pulled by labored breaths. The letters didn't scroll out one by one this time, but appeared as a single block. They only hanged around for about half a second before the video took us back to the dusty floorboards. Grey Wool, Sobbing Girl, and Her Hulking Guardians. Except, she wasn't sobbing anymore. She wasn't smiling either. 
Even though her gaze was directly into the camera, her expression was blank. Still laced with an unexplainable magnetism, but the perkin spark from the segment where she spoke to us was gone. She raised the potato peeler in front of her face. Before I knew what was happening she dragged the blade down in a single, uninterrupted motion. She didn't wince, didn't flinch, didn't register in any way the sharp metal slicing through the bridge of her nose. The removed flesh rolled itself into a damp curl as she peeled. It fell to the ground with a wet splat that was far too loud for comfort. Scarlet gushes joined the streaks of dark makeup her earlier tears had dislodged. Pale bone was visible in the wound. The button tip of her nose hung on a thread from where the peeler had found its way too deep, and she had to yank it out. The blood pulled at the dangling chunk, dripping on her expensive skirt. She didn't even blink. Someone threw up. I could smell it, although the sounds of the hurling felt like they came from some other world. I was lost in the woman on the screen. I couldn't look away, and I didn't mean that my curiosity got the better of me. I was actively trying, putting so much strain into turning my head that veins on my neck began to bulge. My eyes dropped. The tiny muscles used to move them left and right screamed, threatening to tear from the force I put on them. Didn't work. I was helpless, sat on the dirty carpet, unable to stop watching as she dragged and dragged the gleaming metal. On occasion the blade would get clogged. When this happened she would reach into the bucket, whisking the utensil around to remove the debris. Clouds of red bloomed in the water. The whole time her expression stayed unresponsive to the curls of skin piling up on the floor, the crimson wetness that consumed the lower half of her face the open holes where her nostrils used to be. She should have screamed, but didn't. Part of me knew it was more accurate to say she couldn't. That part of me was the one that wanted to scream too. I was paralyzed, paralyzed and terrified. No matter how much strength of will I mustered, I couldn't turn my head away from the screen, couldn't shut my eyes, couldn't focus on anything other than the scraping of the peeler. Adrenaline and panic took over my mind. My body though, my body seemed to be getting different messages from the girl shearing off her own nose slice by slice. To my absolute disgust, I had pitched a tent. I had never felt uglier, more repulsive, in my life. I'm not a psycho, or a pervert. I'm not. All I wanted to do was not watch. The footage must have tapped into something deep, some latent human infatuation with violence in all of us. That's the only explanation, surely. It's not like a video could hijack your body. Ah, beauty, such minimalism the piano crash was louder this time, closer to the microphone. Again the words only last about half a second. When the trio returned, the small nub of exposed bone was gone. A triangle of open flesh lay at the center of the woman's face, her nose now in wet spirals on her lap and around her feet. The cheeks were next. It was around the time that teeth started to be exposed that I hurled. The entrapment was so strong by this point I could no longer steal quick glances at the boys, but I could hear many of them doing the same. It was a struggle getting the vomit out. I couldn't bend over far enough due to the paralysis, and had to cough it out mouthful by burning mouthful. One of them was laying on their back when the video started. I could tell by the gargled crying that it was Hunt. I felt a tear fall down my cheek, unable to look away from the woman peeling her lower jaw down to the bone as the wails behind me coughed into drowned silence. Somebody managed to get out an almost inaudible whimper. Even though my vision was blurred with tears, I could still make out the half-skeleton in the video. I watched the screen, spitting up the occasional chunk of regurgitated kebab meat, as the blurred figure reached to her right. The woman took two objects from the silver tray that I couldn't quite make out. The orange-headed blob next to her didn't move, but even through the watery haze I could still just about make out the steady rhythm of its breath beneath the bag.
For the first time in my life I was happy to be crying. The weakness in character put up a partial shield, blurring and censoring whatever I was about to see once the woman had positioned the objects next to her dripping half face. You will watch. The crashing came from behind, the unseen pianist slamming on the keys only a few feet away. Something forced me to blink, and I mean that in a very literal sense. It was involuntary, it wasn't a reflex, it was done on command. A command from who, or what I didn't know. My eyes slammed shut, and were quickly wrenched open again by an indescribable and overbearing impulse. All traces of tears were gone. The video swam back into focus just in time, to catch the downward swing of the hammer. Exposed jawbone swing outwards, the chisel following through and digging itself in the underside of the lolling tongue. The limp muscle fell to her throat with a wet slap, hanging there behind the dangling jaw for all to see. The girl was calm when she placed the tools in her lap and reached up for the partially detached bone. Her expression didn't change when she tweaked it loose, discarding her own jaw on the floor with the skin peelings, as though she had just picked a scab. On top of everything else, the stiffness in my jeans hadn't subsided. Were my stomach not empty I would have vomited again, as much from self-disgust as the nightmare Luke's cousin had pulled me into. See what she gives for you, she removes all but the most necessary features. The unseen penis was closer now, but what concentration I still had was focused on Luke's cousin. I could just about see him out of the corner of my eye. He was blinking. I noticed that straight away, because I couldn't unless ordered to. Laying on the floor, less than 10 inches from the screen, his young face was illuminated a ghostly blue by the light from the tablet. I couldn't pull my attention on him much, the video wouldn't allow it, but I could have sworn he managed to shoot the occasional gleeful glance at the rest of us. I was able to notice him enough, to see how his white grin didn't falter, how the joy in his adolescent eyes didn't fade as the woman on screen reached towards her own with a steel ice cream scoop. My own eyes burned with each steady flick of the woman's wrists. My eyelids howled at me, fighting a losing war to close themselves, trying even though it was hopeless to shield my mind from the sight of those bloodied once white orbs plopping to the ground. I had to cough down empty heaves, when the second one rolled towards the camera, the fading pupil locked on my own. It was judging me, and I knew why. The reason I nearly choked on my own vomit wasn't just because of the footage though. The disgust was far more at my own body than at anything the video forced me to watch the girl do to hers. I could feel the wetness in my boxers the moment that first I squelched on the floorboards, Every spasm haunted me, every muscular convulsion scarring me for life. Outside of the nightmare, before it, I had earned the half-joking nickname of Big Shagger on campus. I'd never hated myself for it before now. It wasn't until the girl started removing the skin of her brow like a face mask, that the twitching stopped. My brain must have worked out that shutting my eyes wasn't going to happen. My extremities went numb, the heavy knot in my stomach became a rising lightness, an unpleasant floating sensation that nights of being blackout drunk had left me all too familiar with. The room spinned one way, my insides another. The space behind my eyes prickled. I could feel myself slipping into a blissful unconsciousness. I urged the process on. I was desperate to be out of the nightmare, and if passing out was the only way then so be it. The hand had other ideas. She obliges, she obeys, she complies, this is all for you, I could feel the clammy grip on the back of my head. The fingers worked their way through my hair, pulling and tugging to make sure I had no respite from my own depraved nature. Every time my head lulled forwards it would be wrenched back, the fog of unconsciousness fanned away again and again. I could hear sobs and whimpers from every direction. Every direction that is except where Luke's cousin sat. I could feel his grin, the cracks of his laughter flecking my wet face. The hanging smoke in the air, that stodgy scent of cheap weed, and even cheaper cigarettes, grew thicker by the second. It snaked through my mouth and nostrils, coating the inside of my lungs with heavy phlegm, that left my breathing like that of a drowning man. I gagged for a final time, blood and bile spewing onto the already vomit-sodden carpet.
Perfection. The crashing in my ear canal timed itself perfectly with the moment the woman grasped her own hair and pulled. The scalp came clean off, the fluid motion leaving a glistening skull caked in chunks of red and purple. The text came just as my brain had time to process the final masterpiece. The girl stood tall, proud even, with the two sweating mountains of fat either side of her, the plastic of the bags on their heads still moving with that slow in out rhythm. The floorboards they stood on were washed with blood, a pile of fleshy curls at the woman's high heels, a single eye staring at the camera on top of it. Perfection. The words sliced through the crystal image. My dick recoiled the instant it was cut off from the shaved half-face. To my shock and self-hatred, I was wincing from the sudden removal of the eyeless stare, the tongue lolling free on a jawless neck. My head swam, joints ached, eyes burned. Yet through the taste of vomit and heaving of raw lungs only one thought crossed my mind. Perfection. As soon as I could move I didn't hesitate. I heard shouting behind me as I slammed the door, Luke and his cousin at each other, Lyle calling Hunt's name over and over, Jack screeching incomprehensible gibberish. I didn't care. I booked it from Luke's room and out into the hallway without looking back. I don't really remember the journey to my end of the building very well. I remember taking off my clothes as I ran, throwing the vomit-crusted t-shirt and soap pants into the corridor. I left my phone, keys, wallet. I'm usually protective of the necessities, but in the wee hours of that morning they didn't matter. Nothing did, save for removing as much of what had transpired from myself as possible. People laughed when they saw me sprinting naked through the halls, but the laughter quickly turned to shrieks, and startled mutters as they came close enough, to see the blood and puke slathering my lips. Somehow I kicked down the door to my room. I'm not a strong guy, but desperation and adrenaline meant the old hinge gave way after two blows. Once sure the door was firmly barricaded by my wardrobe I screamed my way through an hour long shower. With the temperature up full the water scaled my skin, at one point leaving actual blisters on my forearms, but it wasn't hot enough. Neither was the bleach I grated in with a scouring pad from the kitchen. Once strips of reddish water started to drip from the end of my shame I gave up, collapsing into a sobbing heap on the tiles. When I woke, the shower was still on, but had long since run cold. I dragged myself into my bedroom, glad that the curtains were still closed. Once I remembered that I had lost my phone, my laptop informed me it was 17.30. I'd slept for about 13 hours. Usually I don't dream after a session, the spliffs and lines take care of that, but on the tiled floor my dreams had been vivid, more lucid than I had ever experienced. Perfection. The word rang and regurgitated over and over in real time, over half a day of formless contemplation of the meaning behind the word the revelatory film had instilled, has instilled, within me. Perfection. I checked Facebook, and awoke to a horde of messages. The lads had been busy whilst I slept. Luke had killed his cousin. About 10 minutes, after I had gone the argument turned into a fist fight, although from Lyle's punctuation free 1000 word long message, I could tell it was less of a fight and more of a murder. Before Lyle knew what to do, Luke had grabbed his cousin's head, smashing the grinning face into a mirror over and over again until the nose was flat, and shards of glass found their way through eyelids, and into grey matter. Hunt had choked on his own vomit, but that's no surprise. After killing his cousin Luke tried to rope Lyle and Jack into helping roll up both bodies in a duvet to dump somewhere. When Lyle refused, Luke had gone at him with a shard of glass. Jack was in no state to do anything, so Lyle grabbed him, and they both licked it. The status update at the top of my news feed let me know what happened to Luke once they'd gone. Charlotte, Luke's flatmate, was going to need therapy for a long time. Maybe forever. She was never one to shy away from details of her grievances online, and this time was no different. Her recollection of events would have been harrowing had it not been for my awakening. Upon barging through his door, to investigate strange noises she had found Luke, naked, kneeling on two face-down bodies. I imagine she didn't stick around long enough, to find out who they were, or she had been told, not to by the police she later mentioned had arrived, but I knew. He was laughing, crying, screaming, every emotion it was possible to feel. A shrieking monster surrounded by the dead and shards of bloodied mirror. 
the part that would truly disturb Charlotte, the part that would give her recurring nightmares, of what should have been any normal morning, was what he clenched in his hands and mouth. Three sets of severed male genitals. Judging by her capitalized paragraph, Luke had a large wound between his legs that confirmed one of them was his own. Perfection. Flicking my eyes back to the message told me things hadn't gone much better in Jack and Lyle's flat. They lived on the seventh floor, a fact that Lyle wasn't quick enough to stop Jack exploiting. To prevent exactly what Jack had been planning the large windows only opened a few inches. Lyle heard the glass smash, but was only able to kick the door through in time to catch the sight of Jack's ankles disappearing beyond the sill. By the time Lyle reached the window Jack was a red crater on the concrete. A quick glance outside my curtain showed me at least six pairs of flashing lights. The door supervisor was talking to a police officer, pointing up at my window. I knew what I had to do, but didn't have long to do it. Perfection. Moving the barricade, interrupting my flatmate's romantic dinner, ignoring their screams as I threw the fridge in front of the door, stabbing them until they made no more noise, finding the potato peeler at the back of the cupboard, all of these I found easy. I had purpose now. I made sure to add the bed to the wardrobe, when resealing my bedroom door behind me. I needed time, a resource that the hammering on the door to the flat beyond the barricade, told me I didn't have. I could hear somebody shouting my name. A deep male voice, human in a way, that I soon would not be. Perfection. I grasped the potato peeler in my hand. My palms were sweating, but not from nerves. It was anticipation. No, not anticipation excitement. The same excitement I used to feel in that moment where a girl throws you down on her bed and unhooks her bra. The plastic pressed into my fingers felt realer than any woman I'd ever touched. I gazed at myself in the mirror. Bloodshot eyes, a hooked nose, lips dried out from too many cigarettes and late nights. All of it holding me back, all of it clouding my vision for so long. I didn't win since the peeler made its first incision. I'm so glad I watched that fucking video. Perfection. Have you ever heard of Hell Spells? Not the song, but the drug. I was sitting in my 11th grade mandatory drug class, which stood for Drugs Are Not Cool. Mrs. Kopik was droning on and on about psychedelic drugs, inhalants, STDs, and how if you have sex you'll get pregnant and die. I sat in the back corner of the class, smirking at a ridiculous conjecture and scrolling on my phone. I saw an advertisement on the bottom of the screen for a dark web browser. A few of my friends had been watching some guy from UK read off stories of the dark web, and whatever data mining was rampant on my phone, must have picked up the audio. I remember one of the stories including a drug deal transpiring on something called Silk Road. Zach, please read off the page about Hell's Bells. Mrs. Kopik said in an annoyed tone. Like many other teachers, she knew not to bother harassing me about my phone use. I had a reputation for just getting up and leaving when they decided to challenge me. I grabbed the 16-page package she had given me at the beginning of the class and skimmed until I found the section on Hell's Bells. Hell's Bells tea is a tea brewed from the Hell's Bells plant. The plant is also known as Jimson Weed and Detour. It contains chemicals that both relieve pain and cause hallucinations. Medicinally, the plant can be used as a sedative and painkiller. It is abused as a recreational hallucinogenic drug by some people. I said in a bored tone to the frustrated teacher. The job, Zach. Now, the plant is shaped like an actual bell, and the buzz of a real bell indicating the end of the class chimed. Okay class, your homework is to find a news story about someone's experience on hallucinogens that resulted in harm or misfortune. The class groaned like a horde of annoyed zombies, and we all shuffled out of the class. That day at lunch, I began googling for my homework assignment, desperate to get it done as fast as possible, so I could relax when I got home. As my thumb shuffled through an alarming number of cases from Florida, another advertisement popped up. Deep web browser iOS no one will know. It was as if an actual light bulb went on above my head as I downloaded the app. The rest of the day flew by, and before I knew it I was home, laying on my disheveled bed, typing in the address to the Silk Road. I took a picture of the Hell's Bells from my dank packet, and posted an ad. 
Potent hallucinations held spells. One Bitcoin per head, serious applicants only. I laughed as the ad posted and found some random article for my class homework. The night flew away into rounds of my new favorite MMORPG and loud music my parents hated. Before I knew it I was drifting off. The next day I woke to find I had an email waiting for me in my personal inbox. It was from an address that looked generic as could be, with a name that was equally generic and obviously fake. From J. Smith, hello Zach Mitchell, I want those hell's bells. I will send one bitcoin as requested. Mail the package today. Thank you. VD. How the hell did you get my personal email, pal? I muttered nervously to myself. I had used a fake email when posting that ad, I thought I had been smart. My webcam was even taped up. I went to school and did my best to forget about it all, until I got to lunch. I told my best friend about the whole debacle, and he seemed entirely too excited. Dude, how are you gonna get the Bitcoin? He said practically foaming at the mouth. Another kid came up, some weird skinny girl who no one liked, named Gobby. She spoke with a heavy lisp as she talked. This is total bull crap. One whole bitcoin is like, $53,000. No way someone would send you that. You're just being trolled. She said, smirking. No one asked you, Gobby. Go away. I said with a sneer. As I spoke, another email appeared. From, J. Smith another throwaway account. I said aloud to my friend. Well, read it. He said eagerly. I have made you an account with this bitcoin trader, complimentary for you. You can redeem your payment here, I've already sent it. This is your login information. You're welcome. From VD bro, login in with it. Let's see if he really sent it. Called my friend. Gassed up with the idea of having $53,000 to my name, I eagerly logged in. To my surprise, it was there. The equivalent to $53,000. I knew I had to cash it out before this guy found out I was a fraud. As soon as I could, I duck out of school and headed to every crypto ATM I could find, and at the end of the day I had successfully cashed $12,000. I would pretend to be sick the next day and do it all over again, soon I would have the full amount in my hands. I knew I had to stash the money, before my loser dad found it, and spent it all on booze. I pulled out an old Monopoly game from the closet in my room, took the contents outside and burned it. I came back inside, and stashed the money in the box, and carefully replaced it in my closet. The day of walking all around my busy city wore me out, and before I knew it I was asleep. The next day I awoke to a text message from a number I had never seen before. Hello Zach, I saw you were busy yesterday. Did you send the bells? VD. My heart sank as I read the words like the epitaph on my grave. This guy was watching my every move, and got my personal phone number. I wasn't messing with a normal guy. After all, this guy did send me a massive amount of money for some crappy drugs. Surely, this must be some kind of hoax. I told my dad I was sick, and he responded by grunting and shuffling off to his beat up truck, on his way to another day at the car plant. As he pulled away, I got on my bike and went to every ATM I could find. That day it wasn't so great, I only got $7,000. A couple ATMs were closed, and I could only go so far on my bike. As I pulled in my driveway I saw I was getting a call, and I knew I would be making it die rare if I answered. Instead, I dropped the phone in a sewer drain. The next day I awoke to the feeling of being watched. I ran to my dingy window and moved a curtain aside to see a black sedan with tinted windows outside my house. As I squinted my eyes to observe it further, the window rolled down, and a newspaper flew out. The car sped off. I got dressed and retrieved the paper only to see it read. Where are my hell spells? And VD sends their regards, written in for every column. The pictures depicted rotting animals and the drug known as hell spells. Was this a threat? I ran inside and tried to tell my dad everything. All my father said was I never liked those, scary. Stick to shrooms. And he walked away. My jaw dropped and I went to school, desperate to get away from that sedan. The day wore on, and every time I had to work on a school computer, I would receive email after email. That was until I got to dank class with Mrs. Kopik. I sat in the corner, hoodie on, and head down. Before I knew it, the bell was chiming, and I sluggishly got to my feet to leave the class. Before I could leave, Mrs. Kopik stopped me. What's wrong? 
Where's your phone? She said in a stern voice. I began to cry. The day wore on, and every time I had to work on a school computer, I would receive email after email. That was until I got to dank class with Mrs. Kopik. I sat in the corner, hoodie on, and head down. Before I knew it, the bell was chiming, and I sluggishly got to my feet to leave the class. Before I could leave, Mrs. Kopik stopped me. What's wrong? Where's your phone? She said in a stern voice. I began to cry. Some hull keeps sending me stuff, so I threw it away. I played a prank on the dark web and this guy found me. My dad won't help, and he was outside my house I trailed off a snot poured out of my nose, and her arms pulled me into a hug. I know someone who can help. She said softly, and she guided me out of the classroom. I was surprised to find myself in the computer lab with only three people in it, two nerdy guys I never bothered to learn the name of, and Gobby. I chaperone Gabi a lot, she knows quite a bit about this kind of thing. Mrs. Kopik said. I sheepishly approached Gabi and explained everything to her. She grinned when I finished talking and asking in a snarky voice. So you want my help, I take it. Please, Gabi, I heard these people are killers. I said trembling. She chuckled and demanded my login info to the website, where I had redeemed my bitcoin. That app you used was bogus, some hacker got your IP address, then your email, then you used this website he made up, and he used you as a foot soldier to launder his mind bitcoin. He's going to continue to harass you until you give him the full $53,000. Wow, Zach, you were a real idiot in how you handled this. Gobby said laughing. I don't have it. I said trembling. That's it, I'm getting the police involved. Mrs. Kopik said. No. Gobby and I both said. That'll make it worse, Mrs. Kopik. That will escalate things, Gobby said carefully. In fact, it's probably better you go, you're going to want deniability. You kids come get me, if things get worse, she said as she left. She's nice, but kind of useless, Gobby said to me. I laughed a little, and ran my hands through my hair. Here's what I'm going to do for you, I'm going to find a real seller of Hell's Bells, and reroute their sale to this CD person. I'll pay for it out of my own cryptocurrency, and you'll pay me back. This hacker is calling your bluff, and has you. But if you really send the drugs, he has no real play other than blackmail. Is there anything you can get blackmailed for? She said, jabbing my side. I shook my head swiftly. He could always just try and hurt you, but we're gonna skip town. She said with a wild look in her eyes. What? I said jaw hanging agape. That's the favor, you're going to take me out of this crappy town. She said locking me in her gaze. Okay, I guess we have to. It's this or get wrecked by some hacker. I said, pulling at my hair. Good call. Gabi said returning to her computer and typing away furiously. Done. Now go home and pack. I'll pick you up at 2am and we'll get out of here. She said. There I was at 2am, monopoly box in one arm, duffel in the other. My father would hardly note my disappearance. Gobby pulled up in an ancient looking truck, and I reluctantly joined her. We bounced from town to town for months, and other the course of the months, we grew close. I began to see her as less of a nuisance, and we even started to become romantically involved. That was until I woke up in the middle of the night and found her laptop open. There it was, a welcome screen greeting Gobby, saying the following in big letters that sealed my fate as the world's biggest fool. Welcome, Vicious Delirium. VD. Dobby had been the one to blackmail me, it all made sense. The hacker conveniently forgot about me, because I left town. I was so stupid and naive. I heard stern, and turned around to face Gobby sleeping soundly. I gathered everything I had, all that remained of our money, and took to the road again, without her. The messages have returned. Every time I try, and use my phone, it powers down. I know she's chasing me, tracking my every move. I don't see an escape to this, so I'm posting this in hopes someone can give me some insight on how to ditch this crazy chick. I don't know if you've ever heard of Hell's Bells, but you don't even have to do them for it to ruin your life.